This is Daniel Simon uh, from Baton Rouge Community College. This is my uh, continuing podcast on the Roman world, dealing with the um, early Roman history, um, mostly under the Roman Republic. Now, um, we're next going to, of course, talk about the more detail into the actual Punic Wars. Um, the, there were uh, three Punic Wars overall, uh, which last from 264 down to one. Uh, 46 BC. Uh, so the Romans and the Carthaginians fought over like a hundred years, but it was off and on. Um, now, like I said, the um, Carthaginians probably had a bigger advantage. Uh, I wouldn't say their army was bigger, but they had a better naval power. They had a lot more wealth than the Romans had. The Romans had probably a bigger army, uh, but they were inexperienced naval-wise. Now, um, First Punic War was mostly a naval battle, uh, and they also fought on the island of Sicily. Sicily was one of the main issues that started the Punic Wars. Both Rome and Carthage wanted to control Sicily. Sicily uh, was kind of vital because it was kind of between uh, Europe, where Italy is, and North Africa. Uh, also, Italy was uh, also Sicily uh, uh, below Italy. It's also kind of a breadbasket where they could grow crops. And it also uses a port. And so both wanted to control it to kind of jump from either, you know, Rome from Italy to Africa, or maybe Carthage was thinking they could jump to Europe, you know, from there. So um, most of the um, First Punic War was a naval war. And uh, over time, the Romans uh, developed their own naval power uh, in the First Punic War. They mostly did this by copying. Uh, Carthaginian ships that they found, um, which were mostly galley-type ships. And uh, from there, the Romans were able to eventually start, you know, beating uh, the Carthaginians on the high seas. Uh, a lot of the um, uh, Roman naval ships were famous for this boarding device or boarding bridge uh, that was well known, which was called a corvus. Uh, it was about a 30-foot-long like landing bridge that they would throw onto enemy ships and they would use that to storm their ships. And so in a sense, the um, Roman Navy um, tried to turn, you know, naval battles into land battles, which they were good at. And uh, so <clears throat> with the Roman Navy, they were able to eventually break the back of the uh, Carthaginian Navy. And that played kind of a major role on why the Romans were able to take control of Sicily after the war. Um, the First Punic War was the longest, of course, uh, war out of the three Punic Wars, and it's the least that people really study about. Uh, there was kind of a gap between the wars. Uh, between the wars, the Romans took over Sicily, and then a few years later, because they had the naval power now, they took over Sardinia, and they took over Corsica, which were to the west of Italy. So now they control a lot of the islands, you know, in the Western Mediterranean Sea. Uh, while this is going on, the Carthaginians then crossed over to where Spain is. They began colonizing that. That was done under the Carthaginian general Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar was the uh, father of Hannibal. You probably know that or have heard of that. Uh, and um, Hamilcar was instrumental in trying to develop. Um, Spain, which became kind of a Carthaginian province, and uh, it was called different names. I think some people called it New Carthage or something like that. And um, from there, uh, they absorbed a lot of the culture there, which Spain had a lot of types of peoples there, Spanish peoples there. Uh, they were kind of similar to the Celts. Now, um, what happened next, after Hamilcar died, um, Hannibal took over. Hannibal Barca, of course, was his son. Hamil and Hannibal was, uh, as you know, very famous uh, during the um, Punic Wars. He's considered the greatest Carthaginian general that they had. Uh, he was considered a military genius, uh, known for being the father of uh, what we call military strategy. So he was a tactical genius. Um, the Romans were scared to death of him. Uh, in fact, there was an old Roman saying, which was um, Hannibal's at the gates. 
<laughs> that they would say. Um, I think it's Hannibal ad Portis in Latin. Uh, and um, so, yeah, many, many Romans were heavily frightened of Hannibal. Hannibal came really the closest to really destroying the Roman world um, in what would become later part of the Second Punic War. Now, how did the Second Punic War break out? Uh, the Second Punic War broke out because uh, there was a controversy over Spain, like who should control it. Uh, the Carthaginians were trying to colonize at the time, uh, and um, uh, what happened was uh, there was a, a city that was in eastern Spain called Saguntum. Uh, but I think Saguntum was this uh, city that had been founded by the Greeks a long time ago. And Hannibal thought that area should be part of Carthaginian. And the Saguntums had uh, formed an alliance with the Romans. So um, 219, I think it is, um, Hannibal laid siege to it, sacked it, and that sparked the whole Punic Wars, which I think broke out around 218. Well, the Romans thought that Hannibal would just stay in Spain, and they'd fight him there, but that's not what happened. And so... Hannibal amassed a huge army, which I think is a debate about how big it was, maybe 100,000, possibly the most. And he marched his forces into Italy, and he took war elephants with him. And that's one thing he's famous for, Hannibal, uh, fighting with elephants. Uh, he took about maybe 37 elephants with him, about 37. And elephants were like terror weapons that he used as like cavalry to trample um, like infantry and so on and cavalry. And uh, Hannibal was famous for doing something that nobody had ever done before. He took a huge army through the mountains of the Alps. He crossed the Alps, uh, which nobody thought he could do, uh, let alone the Romans. Uh, and so Hannibal crossing the Alps is considered one of his greatest feats uh, that anybody's ever done like that. He lost half his army trying to get through uh, in the dead of winter. Uh, then he came down through northern Italy, uh, the Romans, of course, uh, first tried to fight uh, Han Hannibal, you know, single combat, um, you know, mano a mano, you know, with their armies. And, of course, uh, they found out that Hannibal's forces uh, were just not, a, they just too much of a match for him uh, because of uh, Hannibal's uh, tactical uh, strategies that he employed on the battlefield. That and all the elephants trampling over some of the soldiers didn't help either. <laughs> and... Um, so in several battles, um, like the Battle of Lake Trezamine, uh, Le uh, River Trebia, um, 218, 217, uh, a lot of the Roman forces uh, were badly destroyed. Um, I think almost like 50,000 or more were killed in both those battles. And then uh, the Romans decided that they were going to try to trap Hannibal's forces uh, in what is southern Italy. So they amassed a huge army of about 80,000 troops uh, in like the bottom of Italy, like kind of like southern Italy or Naples. And uh, near a town called Cannae, which is like on the Adriatic Sea, um, they tried to fight Hannibal's forces in August of 216. And, um, of course, bad idea. Uh, Hannibal, of course, had a strategy awaited at that point uh, to defeat uh, that particular force, and um, the Roman army was so huge, they had two generals. Uh, they had one guy named Gaius Vero, uh, and another guy named Lucius Paulus. Paulus, of course, would get killed in the battle, and um, so each was, was, you know, commanding the forces, and um, anyway, what the, uh, what the, uh, I think it was Vero decided that he was just going to try to attack Hannibal's forces up the middle, like as a frontal assault uh, with his Roman legions. And uh, what the Romans didn't understand was that Hannibal was basically waiting for that opportunity uh, for them to do that. And when uh, their forces came up in the center, uh, what Hannibal did uh, was he formed kind of a crescent shape where he let the Roman force push his forces in. And then he began encircling the um, Roman forces on the left and the right flanks with infantry and then he used his cavalry uh, to attack the Roman force in the rear. Uh, and so what happened at Cannae uh, was the Carthaginians employed what they call a double envelopment, uh, or maybe more like a perfect en double envelopment, 
that led to kind of a pincer movement on the left and the right flanks. And then they encircled uh, the Roman force uh, and eventually almost destroyed it. Uh, and um, about 50,000 of the Romans were killed in the battle. Uh, it was considered one of the bloodiest battles in Roman history and probably the bloodiest battle that the Romans ever fought in, probably the most men they ever lost in a single battle. Uh, and um, like I said, one of the Roman generals was killed, which was Paulus. Lucius Paulus got killed. Uh, Vero fled back to Rome after that. And pretty much there wasn't anybody that didn't know that somebody that got killed in the battle. It was that bad on the Roman side. So it looked like at that point that Hannibal was just going to win the whole war in Italy. Uh, however, Hannibal uh, hesitated and uh, he refused to lay siege to uh, Rome. Uh, why is that? Uh, they believed that he didn't have enough forces to do, to do so. Uh, they think he took a lot of heavy casualties too uh, at Cannae as well. So that didn't help, you know, his forces. And then what happened after that was that the Romans then kind of used kind of a guerrilla action against Hannibal. They refused to basically fight him you know, head on, which also hurt uh, Hannibal's forces because his mercenaries weren't able to really finish the war. So the war kind of dragged on for years uh, in Italy for like another 10, 12 years with neither side really winning the war. Uh, then the Romans under this other general named Scipio Africanus eventually would win the Second Punic War uh, Scipio was considered the greatest Roman general in the Second Punic War. Uh, he was um, Hannibal's uh, nemesis. Uh, and he was, in, they think, involved in a lot of these early battles where the Romans lost. And Scipio realized that the only way they were gonna, really going to beat Hannibal was to kind of emulate uh, the Carthaginian forces and copy what ha Hannibal was doing. And that's what he did. And so uh, Scipio went on the offensive, and they began attacking the weaker aspects of the um, Carthaginian Empire. Uh, they first attacked Spain uh, and seized that uh, first, uh, which I think they did by, I want to say, 208, 206. Um, pretty much had taken over uh, Spain at that point. And then from um, southern Italy and Sicily, they then were able to then uh, use their naval power uh, to attack North Africa and land forces uh, where Carthage is. And so they did that as well by about maybe 204 or so. Uh, they started doing that. And that eventually forced Hannibal to leave Italy because uh, he realized that if he didn't go back to, um, you know, uh, North Africa at that point, pretty much Carthage was finished. And so um, Hannibal then returned uh, to North Africa to face Scipio, Scipio's forces. The two would eventually fight it out in 202 BC at the Battle of Zama, which was fought south of Tunis in modern Tunisia. Uh, Zama, of course, was considered one of the last great classical battles of the ancient world. Uh, it pitted two great geniuses, Scipio Africanus uh, versus uh, Hannibal. It's almost like, you know, Waterloo, you know, you know, Wellington versus Napoleon. Uh, and um, both, of course, employed different strategies. If you know about it, Hannibal tried to rely a lot on war elephants, which he had a bunch in that battle. Uh, that proved to be obsolete, because by that time, the Romans had figured how to fight elephants. Um, and what Scipio relied more on was not just heavy infantry, uh, but on a better crack cavalry, uh, which, you know, Han uh, Hannibal had used before, had like can I, uh, and so that played kind of a pivotal role uh, in why Scipio eventually routed Hannibal's forces, because uh, Hannibal eventually gets encircled, even though he had a, I think Hannibal had a larger force, but he got encircled. And uh, the elephants were just useless because uh, the Romans figured they could just park their, uh, their legions and let the elephants just kind of wander through uh, and just kill them in the back. And so um, elephants were just pretty much obsolete after that. Uh, there's a famous story about 
uh, the Battle of Zom, which is well known. Some people may have heard of this before. But there's a story where the two generals met. I think it happened before and after the battle. Uh, and uh, they later became kind of like friends, uh, Scipio and Zama. There's a story where uh, Scipio asks um, Annibal, who was the greatest general of all time. And, of course, what um, Annibal said was Alexander the Great. Uh, however, he did say that if I beat you, Scipio, it'll be me. He shouldn't have said that, though, because <laughs> he lost. Uh, but anyway, but um, Hannibal itself was still kind of a nemesis to the Romans. Uh, after, I think, Scipio died, um, Hannibal went into exile, uh, and eventually the um, Romans went after him. I think if you know about the story about this, Hannibal later fought for the um, Seleucid Empire in the east, uh, and the Romans tried to track him down, and instead of getting captured, uh, Hannibal took poison, so he committed suicide. So that's what happened to the Second Punic War. Uh, aftermath of the war, of course, was that the Romans took over Spain. That was the big thing that, of course, happened. So Spain becomes part of the Roman world. And then uh, the um, Carthaginians had to pay a huge um, series of war reparations, with it, which they paid off in like 50 years after that. Now, um, the Third Punic War was more decisive. Uh, the Third Punic War mostly broke out uh, because the Romans were worried that the Carthaginians might make a comeback, like another Hannibal War here again. Uh, and so there was a lot of people in the Senate that were for the war overall. Also, the senators in the Roman Senate saw it as an opportunity to conquer Carthage in North Africa, seize all the land, which they thought was very valuable, and then add that to the Republic, which was starting to become an empire at that point. And uh, there was a, a famous um, Roman senator, you may have heard of him, Marcus Cato, uh, who was called Cato the Elder. I think he was also a Roman censor at one point. Well, they call him also Cato the Censor, I think, as well. He started making speeches in the Senate uh, talking about war, and they ought to go to war um, with... Um, with Carthage, and uh, he kept making this uh, statement at the end of his speeches, uh, which was famous, which was uh, Carthago de Linda S, which, if you know about it in Latin, means Carthage must be destroyed. Uh, and so it didn't matter what he was talking about, he would always mention about this fact that they, they ought to be destroyed, like a preemptive strike on them or something like that to wipe them out. Uh, and so eventually that's what happens because of, you know, Cato urging this uh, popularized the whole a lot of war hawks to go after uh, Carthage and so eventually around 149 uh, Rome declared war on Carthage uh, they actually think it was caused by a conflict between uh, Carthage and Numidia which was right next to Carthage but uh, the uh, Romans used it as a pretext to go in there and uh, they invaded North Africa and laid siege to Carthage they thought the Carthaginians would just give up uh, they didn't want to give up, uh, and so the Carthaginians then uh, fortified themselves inside the city of Carthage, which I think was close to half a million people lived there. And um, the um, siege of Carthage lasted for months, months and months, uh, where the Romans couldn't break in. And eventually they stormed the city in 146 B.C. Uh, there was a Roman general named Scipio Aemilianus, who was uh, one of Scipio's grandsons, he stormed the city. And the Romans burned it to the ground. They, they wiped it out. Uh, and uh, according to Polybius, who gives a lot of information about the sack of um, Carthage, uh, he said that Carthage burned for like 17 days. And um, a lot of the inhabitants of, of Carthage were killed uh, afterwards. I think, I want to say three-fourths maybe may have been killed in the siege, and the rest were all enslaved uh, by the Romans. Uh, there is a famous legend, of course, about the sack of Carthage that uh, it was um, plowed under, and the Romans took salt, and they salted it, you know, the whole earth was salt. And um, they're not sure if that's really true. I know they did destroy the city and all that, uh, which you can look at pictures of it today, which are mostly ruins there. But uh, they think that story is actually a made-up story. Uh, the Romans did rebuild like a 
Rome and Carthage afterwards. It was kind of like in the same area. Uh, but the old city never flourished afterwards. It was destroyed, burned down, and um, the salt story is likely is made up. So, oh well. All right, now, um, after the Third Punic War, pretty much the Romans are starting to take over um, the whole Mediterranean Sea, which a lot of people start calling it Mare Nostrum, which means um, our sea is what the Romans called it. And so the Romans start marching over. They take over Greece. They take over Turkey. They take over Syria. All that's being controlled uh, by the Romans. Eventually, by the first century, they take over Egypt. So eventually, by the first century B.C., the whole Mediterranean world, like around the sea, uh, will be controlled by the Romans uh, as a whole. Later on, Julius Caesar's time, they'll take over Gaul. Uh, later, later under the empire, uh, they'll take over like Britain. So they start expanding all over the place, uh, the Roman Empire. And uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the uh, decline of the Republic, which, you know, becomes an empire. Uh, there are different theories about why the uh, Roman Republic declined. Uh, one was a lack of reforms. Uh, one of the big things that the Romans tried to do uh, in the 2nd century, century B.C. was make land reforms. And if you know what happened uh, after the... Romans took over all this territory that they conquered. Uh, a lot of the Roman senators wanted the land because they wanted to build these huge plantations, uh, which were made up of, like, slaves. Which, you know, most of the Roman world was made up of a lot of slaves, uh, either like a fourth or a third, maybe. And uh, I think they were called, the plantations were called latifundia, is the term they used. And, uh, and then they had some people like the plebes, the plebeians, wanted to um, create land reform and give the land back to the, uh, the soldiers, the veterans that had fought in the Punic Wars. And there, there, there were these two brothers that were named Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus in the uh, end of the second century BC. They tried to make land reforms uh, where they wanted to pass a bunch of legislation mostly through the plebeian council because they were plebes. And um, a lot of the land reforms were were um, shut down by the patricians, like the Roman Senate that didn't want to do this. Tiberius was later killed. And I think uh, Gaius was later hunted down. He, he was forced to commit suicide. So a lot of the reforms didn't come out like they should have. Uh, and I think later, yeah, a lot of the soldiers do get land Usually after you serve a long time, you would. Uh, but I guess too much of the land was in the hands of the upper class instead of the lower class overall. Uh, of course, the other thing that happened too with the Romans was that you had a lot of these um, Roman uh, statesmen uh, that took over the armies. Uh, you know, a lot of these became like military-style dictators. That's the other thing that kills the Republic as well. Uh, so you'll see the rise of Gaius Marius, Sola, Cornelius Sola, Julius Caesar, Marcus Crassus, Gnaeus Pompey, Mark Antony, Octavian. All these were examples of these so-called dictators uh, that take over. And most of them were patricians. They were from the patrician class uh, overall. Or maybe one of them were not. Probably Marius was equestrian. But um, in any way, uh, but they most of them came from the patrician class, upper class. And um, they actually did split into different groups, like the Optimates, you may have heard of, and the Populares, which were not really political parties, but just different uh, political positions that a lot of the patricians took. And um, like Julius Caesar was a Populares man that supported the plebes. Uh, guys like, um, I think later Pompey, I know, uh, and Sola were... Uh, yeah, maybe Sola and I think also Crassus were more of a uh, optimates man. They supported like the wealthy causes in the patrician senatorial class as a whole. Oh, civil wars. Of course, these um, one thing about these dictators uh, as they take over the Roman state, it creates civil wars uh, as well. And they think civil war was one of the main things uh, that would kill the republic especially Caesar's Civil War, started by Julius Caesar. It's the big one. 
Uh, but there's like several civil wars in the first century BC that lead to the end of the Republic, pretty much, you know. All right, now uh, let's first talk about some of these political type dictators that we're talking about. Well, one, of course, was Gaius Marius, uh, who emerged kind of at the end of the uh, second century and early first century BC. Marius was a very famous Roman general. Uh, who had fought in different wars after the uh, Punic Wars ended. And um, Marius was a statesman that had held uh, the position of consul multiple times. I think it was like seven times he had been Roman consul. And um, anyway, um, Marius was known for a lot of uh, reforms, especially to the Roman army, uh, which were called the Marian Reforms. And these were a series of uh, reforms to professionalize the Roman armies, uh, which had been decimated in the Punic Wars. And uh, under his reforms, uh, any Roman citizen could join uh, the Roman army. I think mean, they had requirements like they do today. But uh, they basically got rid of requirements that were based off of, like, social standing or wealth. And so what happened later was that a lot of the Roman armies became more of the poor people, especially in the infantry. And in light of your cavalry was still a lot of the aristocrats or upper classes. Um, the other thing that he did, and they think that's bad because um, they think that one aspect with the you know, change of how they you know, recruited soldiers, um, was it played a major role in why the Republic declined later because a lot of these soldiers were more loyal to the general than the actual state itself. And all these generals, of course, had to fight wars to pay their soldiers. Uh, the other thing he did too, um, Marius, he created the uh, Roman legions of later. And uh, traditionally, the Roman legions, uh, the main unit that was important, that was the fighting unit that was in it, was the cohort. Uh, the cohort was a um, unit or fighting unit of 480 legionnaires. And um, a Roman legion makes up about 10 of those. And uh, cohorts themselves are also divided into six centuries. And a Roman century has 80 men in it uh, total. So the average Roman soldier uh, could serve, you know, around 20 years as a whole uh, which might include, I think, 60 years if you're in infantry, uh, and then I think you have to go in reserve afterwards, maybe four years or something like that. And so uh, that's if you live that long as a whole. Now, uh, over time, Marius was, um, he had another rival uh, that was named Cornelius Sola. Sola was a Roman general uh, that rose to power in the early part of the um, first century B.C., and uh, Sola and uh, Marius eventually got involved in a civil war that was called sometimes Sola's Civil War, which lasted about six years from 88 to 82 B.C. And uh, Sola proved to be more powerful, and uh, he and his armies eventually defeated Marius, forced him into exile. And then Marius, um, after he was defeated, Sola was able to uh, march on Rome and take control of it, which he did with his armies. And uh, Sola then was declared dictator of Rome, uh, which I believe was in 82 B.C., and he held that position in, until about 79 B.C. So, in a sense, Sola was the one that kind of um, repopularized the position of dictator, uh, which had been around before and you know, from Roman times. And dictators are kind of like the, the Greek tyrant. It's kind of similar. Uh, then later they had the triumphants formed, and um, the, of course the big one that they, you hear about later is the first triumvirate, which forms in 60 BC. Uh, this was a three-man dictatorship uh, that was run by um, three powerful Roman men, uh, which was Julius Caesar, uh, he was like the youngest, and then you had Gnaeus Pompey and Marcus Crassus, uh, were eventually Roman generals and statesmen who were uh, patricians in the Roman Senate. And they made this uh, secret pact between them to you know, control Rome at the time. And uh, Pompey and um, Crassus, uh, they had rose to power as lieutenants 
under um, Sola during the Sola Civil War. They had fought under him, and um, they were known for putting down this Spartacus Revolt, which was this slave revolt uh, that broke out in the Rome Republic, um, which I think was lasted about 73 to 71 B.C., also called the Third Servile War. And uh, this was a um, slave revolt that was founded by the um, ex-gladiator named Spartacus, who was from Thrace. He fought multiple um, um, Roman armies. And um, Pompey and, and Crassus became famous for defeating them. Um, and so um, that was their claim to fame. And then Caesar became famous for his um, campaigns in Gaul. Uh, he would, in the 50s BC, uh, would eventually conquer what is Gaul, which is uh, what we call France now, or modern France. 58 to about, I think, 52 BC is about when the war lasted, roughly. And um, for like six, seven years or so, um, Caesar conquered it. It was considered one of the greatest conquests in Roman history at the time. And uh, Julius Caesar, of course, proved to be a great general, one of the greatest generals in Roman history as a whole. But it was also a series of bloody wars uh, where about a million people were killed. So it was pretty bloody, uh, the, Gaelic, the Gaelic Wars. Um, Caesar is known for invading Britain, I think, twice. Uh, and he also invaded Germany. Uh, but pretty much the Romans don't conquer Britain uh, until later, under the early part of the empire. So that's making Caesar kind of famous. Uh, Caesar even wrote a series of books on the um, campaigns in Gaul, which were called the Commentaries on the Gaelic Wars. This made, made him very, very popular uh, overall. And he was, uh, Caesar was very, very popular with the with the plebeians. He was kind of a man of the people. Uh, and so a lot of the Roman Senate was starting to get really worried about Caesar. Uh, then they had Caesar's civil war break out. Uh, what happened was the first triumphant broke up uh, due to Marcus Crassus getting killed. He was killed in various campaigns firing in the east against the Parthians. And um, that, left, that left only Gnaeus Pompey on Julius Caesar as rivals. And so the two fought it out for control of Rome. Uh, Pompey, of course, sided with the Roman Senate, who was against Caesar. And Caesar was either had the forces to be, you know, submit to them or fight Pompey. And so what happened was in 49 BC, Caesar decided to attack Rome and Pompey. And so he did. And this started what they call Caesar's Civil War. Uh, which would last from about 49 to about 45 B.C. And um, Caesar's armies, uh, mostly one legion and more later, uh, would eventually invade Italy. He crosses what is called the River Rubicon, uh, which is between Gaul uh, and northern Italy. This was believed to be um, what causes the war to break out because under um, Roman law, he wasn't supposed to uh, take his command uh, from Gaul, from one province to another. Um, Caesar only had control of Gaul, pretty much. Pompey had control of, I guess, Italy. And uh, when he did this, it sparks the war, and Pompey and the Senate declares war on Caesar. And Caesar realized that he's, you know, got no choice at this point. Uh, he makes a famous comment or quote uh, at the River Rubicon, which is the die is cast. And what he meant by that was that there's basically no going back. Uh, there's an old saying, which is um, crossing the Rubicon, I think they dub it, uh, is basically saying that, you know, you're rolling the dice here. And that's what he meant by that, you know, uh, the die is cast, and I'm gambling here uh, with my um, existence, uh, my future. So um, uh, Caesar's forces invades Italy. Uh, he takes Rome easily because uh, Pompey then flees over to Greece uh, to get like a larger army because he doesn't have enough forces to fight Caesar. Caesar's forces are crack troops. And so Caesar races 
all the way to Spain, it takes over Spain, then races back uh, towards Greece uh, to face Pompey's forces uh, in what is um, Greece. Now, what is called the Battle of Pharsalus in 44 BC, uh, Caesar's army, which is actually smaller than Pompey's, totally routs Pompey's forces, just destroys his army. And um, a lot of Pompey's forces refused to fight. They didn't really want to fight Caesar. Uh, it was like brother against brother. And so some of his forces actually gave up in the battle, which didn't help him either. Uh, so Pompey, uh, at this point, is on the run. Uh, he then fled uh, to what is Egypt and uh, under the uh, Ptolemaic kingdom that was still in power at the time. And uh, there was a king in, in power named uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth, uh, thinking that he could get on the side of the Romans and Julius Caesar, uh, decided to kill Pompey. And so he, he sent some assassins to murder him, uh, stab him to death. And so when Caesar arrived to try to, you know, capture um, Pompey, uh, who's by the way his son-in-law, uh, Pompey was, um, he realizes that uh, Pompey's been killed uh, by, of course, the Egyptians, which actually angered Caesar. Uh, and so Caesar turned against the king, King Ptolemy XIII, and he formed an alliance with Ptolemy XIII's uh, sister, which was uh, Queen Cleopatra, also known as Cleopatra VII. And um, those two became allies, uh, Caesar and Cleopatra. And also, as you know, uh, Cleopatra became a famous uh, lover and mistress of, um, of Jewish Caesar. They actually would have one son together. And um, anyway, Caesar, when he's in Egypt, uh, helps Cleopatra get her throne because uh, Cleopatra ends up in a civil war with her brother, Ptolemy the 13th, who's killed in the war. And of course, the tragic story about the Civil War was that they accidentally, if you know about it, burned down the uh, Library of Alexandria, like in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, but Cleopatra took over, and she rules over pretty much uh, Egypt till 30 BC. Uh, after that, Caesar then races around the whole Mediterranean Sea, and he uh, conquers it. And uh, so the old saying was, Vini, Vidi, Vici. You know, I came, I saw, I conquered. Uh, and uh, the campaigns were so fast that he wrote a letter, I think, to the Senate talking about this. And that's where the quote came from. So by 45 BC, Caesar's pretty much taking over the whole republic. And so that's why Caesar's considered one of the greatest generals in Roman history, because he's able to do that. Uh, then Caesar's made dictator by the Roman Senate. Uh, at first, they made him dictator for 10 years, and then, if you know about it, 44 BC, he's made dictator for life. And um, at that point, Caesar begins making reforms to the state. And um, one of the things that, uh, that of course, scares the, a lot of the Roman senators. So they're really concerned that Caesar's pretty much doing away uh, with the traditional old republic and that this might be looking like a monarchy uh, or tyranny that's starting to you know, form at this point. And so a conspiracy forms at that point to kill uh, Julius Caesar. And uh, the conspirators actually called themselves the liberators uh, because they thought they were liberating Rome from uh, this tyrant, uh, Julius Caesar, and several men uh, were involved. Marcus Brutus, I think, was the most famous you've probably heard of that was a liberator. Uh, another, Gaius Cassius Longinus was another one uh, that was famous, uh, and um, these were all liberators. These had all actually had been friends of not just Caesar, but Pompey. Uh, in fact, I think Brutus had been on the losing side at Pharsalus in 48 BC, uh, and Caesar had, forgive, had forgiven him, which was probably a bad idea. And um, anyway, on the date of March 15, 44 BC, which you know the Romans later called the Ides of March, Caesar uh, went to a senatorial meeting in the, it was actually the um, Theater of Pompey, which is where they were meeting for the day, and he was walking through the annex in um, of course, a bunch of senators came up on him 
uh, to ask him about a petition that they wanted him to sign. And as, when he tried to walk away, uh, they started stabbing Caesar. And so that led to the assassination of Julius Caesar, where he was stabbed multiple times. And of course, they say one of the last that stabbed him was Marcus Brutus. And that's, of course, associated later with that famous quote uh, by Julius Caesar, which is et tu brute. Uh, but they're not sure if that's really, you know, a real quote or not by Caesar. And it means and you, Brutus. And uh, there's a big debate about what Caesar said. Uh, there's different sources, of course, on, you know, the assassination of Caesar. Et tu brute is very famous from the Shakespearean play, of course, Julius Caesar. Uh, there's different theories, but some say he said variations of that, but maybe not that way. Or some say he didn't say anything, which I think Plutarch, I think, may have been one that mentions that he didn't say anything. But um, his death would ignite civil war, uh, which would continue, you know, with the Romans. And they have that so-called civil war of the liberators, where uh, afterwards the second triumvirate formed, right after Caesar died in 43 BC. This was this um, an alliance of uh, three dictators that took over Rome, which was Octavian, who became the heir to Julius Caesar afterwards. Octavian was this 18-year-old grand nephew of Julius Caesar, and he inherited um, pretty much what was in Caesar's will. He inherited his name. Uh, his real name was Octavianus. But they later called him Octavian for short, and uh, he would come to Rome to claim his inheritance, uh, and um, he eventually formed an alliance with two of um, Caesar's generals, which were Mark Antony, who, of course, was one of Caesar's most famous generals, and also another general that was pretty good named Marcus Lepidus. That formed the so-called Second Triumphant, which people pretty much knew about, and um, they used this alliance to uh, eventually destroy the liberators who were hunted down and eventually killed. And then from there, they kind of ruled the state as a dictatorship until they pushed Lepidus out. And sometime around 36 BC, uh, they believe what happened uh, was that uh, Octavian and Mark Antony then formed this dual dictatorship uh, to control Rome. Octavian controlled mostly the western aspect of the Republic, and then uh, Mark Antony controlled the eastern aspect. They kind of split in half, like the Roman Empire's done later. Uh, the two became at odds over time, uh, Octavian and uh, Antony. Antony had married uh, Octavian's sister, which is Octavia, but when uh, Antony went to the east, he met Cleopatra, which I think he had met before, and when she had come to Rome, and um, he fell in love with her, uh, Queen Cleopatra, and the two eventually married, which was kind of real, you know, real controversial uh, when, that, when that happened. And uh, so that became kind of scandalous in the Roman world, and uh, the two would actually have three children together. And um, this really angered Octavian, the Roman Senate, and so that caused war to break out uh, eventually, um, around 33, 32 BC. That led to one of the last civil wars of the Roman Republic, which was called the Final War of the Roman Republic. Uh, some people call it Octavian Civil War. I think some people call it Antony Civil War too. It's called all kinds of names. And uh, the war was mostly fought in Greece and also in uh, Egypt. And uh, the most pivotal battle of the war uh, was in 31 um, BC. They had the Battle of Actium, which was fought off the western coast of Greece. And that was a naval battle where uh, Antony and, Octa Antony and um, Cleopatra's naval forces fought Octavian's forces, and they were badly beaten. And uh, this forced Octavian and, uh, excuse me, that forced um, Cleopatra and Antony to retreat back to Egypt where Egypt was eventually invaded uh, by uh, Octavian. And um, basically at that point, uh, Antony decided to give up. And so he took his sword out and he ran himself through, tried to kill himself, uh, which he later died in Cleopatra's arms. And then later Cleopatra also killed herself.
also as well, which both died in 30 BC. And Antony went on to, you know, conquer Egypt and add that to the Roman Republic, which was becoming an empire. And so after that, nothing was really in his way, uh, Octavian. So Octavian then became the sole ruler of the Roman Republic uh, by the end of the first century BC. So I think by close to about 27 BC, uh, Octavian starts to become what they think is the first Roman emperor, uh, which they'll call Caesar Augustus or Emperor Augustus. Uh, and so that's what Octavian's pretty much goes on to do eventually. So we'll talk later about the beginning of the Roman Empire, uh, which follows at the end of the first century BC. We'll talk about at least half of it uh, in my podcast, which will be in probably week four. So that's pretty much it kind of a basic history of uh, early Roman from the monarchy up through the end of the Republic to Octavian.